This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. So my name is Courtney Carruthers. I'm an associate professor of fisheries at the College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. I'm based in Anchorage, Alaska. I'm a cultural anthropologist. Um, I've had three major focal areas of my research. Um, first, I explore how fisheries privatization processes are remaking fishery systems and fisheries communities. Um, second, I partner with indigenous communities in the Arctic to study social ecological change and subsistence ways of life. And I'm also working with colleagues and communities to, to decolonize and indigenize uh, science and education institutions and processes. As a cultural anthropologist, I've had amazing opportunities to participate in ethnographic research in diverse communities throughout Alaska. One of the first communities I went to is uh, pictured here, Old Harbor. Um, it's a Sukpiak village on the Kodiak Archipelago where people have been making their living from the sea for over 7,500 years. Um, in Dr. Schweik's invitation um, for me to join this uh, really cool 24-hour webinar, he was feeling out if I was interested to give a talk on, or a talk relevant to common scholarship, or if not, if I could suggest a common scholar in the region that, that might consider giving a talk. And so I was thinking about this, I don't really consider myself to be a commons scholar, but as I reflected on this, um, I was thinking a lot about the commons and how the different stories that we tell about the commons has really formed a fundamental basis for my work exploring fisheries privatization processes. So I received my PhD in environmental anthropology at the University of Washington in 2008. My first, for my first year of coursework there and throughout that anthropology program, I was immersed in the teachings of Bonnie McKay, Evelyn Pinkerton, J James Atchison, Fikret Berkey, Steve Lansing, Steve Langdon, Eleanor Ostrom, and many others. And what came to me to be known as a common sense assumption in anthropology and common scholarship more generally, that people close to their land and resources know about their resources and they know how to manage them. That collective action and roles in institutions, while maybe informal, are the norm rather than the exception for understanding human environment systems cross-culturally and across time. But also during that first year of my grad program back in 2008, I also took coursework um, from the School of Marine Affairs, uh, which was then the School of Marine Affairs at the University of Washington. And I learned that fisheries scientists and economists tended to have a completely different view and set of assumptions about human environment relationships. Namely, they had full faith in the, the tragedy of the commons or the tragedy of open access narrative and had a real dogmatic attachment to the property rights problem of fisheries. And at that time, I couldn't really reconcile these two divergent ways of seeing fishery systems, and I really still can't. And I think this is one of the common themes um, in my work and that will hopefully come across today, this tension between different ways of viewing um, the same systems. So in my graduate work, I began a process that's continued now for 15 years, studying processes of privatization and fishery systems in Alaska. These were common property systems that were traditionally managed by indigenous peoples that were then made into colonial extractive systems that were then made into open access systems that were then argued to suffer from a property rights problem to which then access was privatized. Um, and for many of those indigenous communities that has meant dramatic dispossession of their historic property rights and their historic commons management regimes. So today what I wanted to do was draw upon three um, kind of major um, pieces here, three major um, papers and bodies of work. Um, up at the top, I'd like to, um, this is a most recent paper to come out of a body of work ethnographically exploring how the fishery privatization processes have been experienced in Alaska. And so this is a, a paper authored, lead authored by Danielle Ringer, um, who just finished her master's degree um, through our program at UAF. Um, and I wanted to mention the, the sort of intellectual roots of a lot of this work. Um, I thank in particular Bonnie McKay, Steve Langdon, Seth Masinko, Daniel Bromley, Becky Mansfield, and many others for their insightful work, you know, decades ago that really um, heavily shaped a lot of our thinking and, and really shaped our research moving forward. I also wanna thank in terms of this ethnographic body of work, um, some of the fishermen that visited with me early on as I was starting my studies, um, Freddie Christensen, Jean Anderson, Jimmy Skonberg, Nikolai Katelnikov, Jack Wick, among numerous others who shared key stories that I think really gave shape um, to this body of work. 
The next paper listed here is some work um, Catherine Chambers and I worked on um, looking at a global social science review of fisheries privatization and how it's remaking fishery systems. And I'm drawing, gonna draw on that a little bit for the talk. And then last, um, there's a recent paper um, that came out in the uh, PNAS, uh, Moving Beyond Panaceas in Fisheries Governance Using the Case Study of Individual Transferable Quotas or a Privatized Access Approach. Um, led by Oren Young, DG Webster, and a, a whole team of scientists that I will focus on for the, the second half of the talk. Um, I've had a real blessing to work really closely with an amazing group of ladies that I wanted to um, put up on the screen here. Danielle Ringer, Jesse Coleman, Rachel Donkersloat, Jessica Black have been really close partners in the work over the last several years and, and really pushing our thinking. I wanted to, I wasn't sure who would eventually come upon this, who's here today or, or might um, view it online later, but just a note about the terms and the way that I'm using them today. I'm using the term privatization to speak to a variety of processes that um, increase a, a private or an individual personal or corporate allocation and control over what typically is a public resource um, like our fisheries. And usually these processes involve some form of making a commodity, um, something that can be bought and sold uh, and creating markets for the exchange of these um, rights. And fisheries, they, I'm, I'm probably most generally gonna use the, the term individual transferable quotas, ITQs, um, and, and they go by some other names too, but generally the, the idea is that we're privatizing the access rights to uh, commercial fisheries. Um, so social scientists have generated decades of research demonstrating that privatizing fishing access has predictable and differential impacts on various groups of fishermen and fishing communities across the globe. Um, I've summarized uh, some of the um, social and political uh, and a few environmental impacts um, here in this figure that came out of um, our collective work with the PNAS group. And I also wanted to note Fiona McCormick, uh, an anthropologist who's recently published a book on this topic uh, based on her work in New Zealand, Ireland, and Iceland, and Hawaii as well. This body of work shows a lot of consensus. Certainly there are outliers and these kind of impacts don't um, necessarily happen in every single ITQ fishery, but they happen in most of them. Um, crew and skippers, small scale fishermen, New entrants, rural and indigenous communities systematically experience the negative impacts of ITQ systems. For example, rural and indigenous communities are disproportionately affected by the outflow of their historic rights. Um, they suffer great disparities in access to capital uh, and, the and sometimes the political process and by the fundamental lack of fit between ITQ programs and rural community fisheries that aren't profit maximizing but rather based on subsistence livelihoods and cultural values uh, embedded in fishing ways of life. So I wanted to start um, getting into some of the meat of what I'm talking about today by, by reviewing a little bit of that ethnographic research to sort of ground us in the place um, and the context and, and bring in some voices from a lot of the fishermen um, who've lived through these processes and have much more expertise on what these impacts have been than, than those of us scientists studying um, the topic. I've been um, trying to understand, um, as I mentioned, this, 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 these processes of privatization and how they're shifting, remaking fishery systems. What are these differential impacts and inequities? What are the discourses, values, um, practices um, that are changing? How are they changing? So I'm summarizing and pulling a little bit in a hodgepodge of three major projects, um, all based in the Kodiak Archipelago. Um, for those of you not familiar with Alaska, um, the Kodiak Archipelago is in South Central Alaska, uh, about an hour south from Anchorage. And um, there is a major port, uh, Kodiak. Uh, it's one of the largest ports, uh, fishing ports in the nation. Uh, one in three jobs in Kodiak town directly relate to seafood harvesting or processing. Community life still really revolves, revolves around fish in that community. There's also six Alutic Sugpiak villages around the archipelago. They're not connected by road, only by boat or plane. Um, these are indigenous communities that have been making a living from the sea, um, as I mentioned, uh, for about 7,500 years or longer. But their relationships to the sea certainly have shifted a lot over time. There was a Russian colonization in the late 1700s and American colonization in the 1800s that has dramatically shifted life, but, but still communities have been until quite recently very dependent on commercial fishing. Um, so summarizing some of this work, um, it's clear in our work with um, 
fishermen and communities that ITQs are shifting the systems. This is a survey of halibut ITQ holders across the whole North Pacific. Uh, strong agreement that ITQs are shifting um, the values in fishing, they're, they're changing fishing lifestyles. This figure on the bottom shows one example of, of that differential impact that Alaska Native fishermen, these are ITQ holders, show less support for more ITQ management than non-Native fishermen. There's been a large dispossession of rural access. Um, so this is a, a look at Alaska rural local permits in the state fishery. There's been a large um, decrease in our Alaska rural local permits across the state. This figure on the left um, shows the first decade after the state um, salmon access program was put into place to be a commodified market-based access right. Um, and just within the first 10 years of that program, the number of Alaska Native permit holders had been cut um, over in half, and the state doesn't collect ethnicity and race data in its fisheries program anymore, so it's hard to say what that current number is, but it was a very concerning um, statistic. Steve Langdon in particular um, was writing quite a lot in the 80s about this, this really big problem that was um, being experienced. There's a real cri crisis in the communities on Kodiak. Um, there's been an 84% decrease in the number of young people who hold fishing rights. Um, it's really a crisis. Um, people have been making their living, as I said, for a really long time and have endured huge waves of change, extermination and forced labor in the Russian fur trade, uh, resistance, um, giving way to close integration with the commercial salmon fishing and canning in the 18 and 1900s. Um, but communities, community members, community fishermen are really identifying this privatization of their right to fish as a pretty fundamental force upon which they're not quite able to move past yet or to adapt to. So, so communities have really been fighting this for decades and are still trying to get some traction um, on this. For the Aleutic Sugpiak communities of the archipelago, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's a history of, of loss, unfortunately, in terms of their indigenous um, rights. However, their lives in the communities still do re revolve around fish. They're marine-based people. It's part of fishing as part of their identity. Um, th there's a real sense that this is a key piece of, of life here. Um, this is a look at um, one of the first, um, this was a look from uh, 1882, was the first um, cannery built in Carlick. And pretty soon after, within a decade, there were five canneries operating on this spit here. Um, and uh, Native peoples initially resisted the development of commercial fisheries in their area. There's a couple quotes here, this one from the 1800s, um, from one of the chiefs of a Fognac. Uh, we the Native, and this was a village that um, was actually um, relocated during a, a tidal wave, but it, uh, the village of Afognak, we the natives and all of the Russian population of Afognak appeal to your Echo excellency to help us retain possession of the fish streams where we are dependent on getting our winter supply of food for ourselves and our families. We cannot get any chance of fishing in the streams as the cannery fishermen of all the companies operating here have taken possession of the mouths of the river. And this is another quote from 1944 that comes from the Alaska Packers Association, one of the main canneries of this time period. Um, Nothing must be done which may constitute any recognition on our part that the Karlik Indian Reservation is valid or legal or anyone has any rights in connection with our property. It is important therefore that we continue our fishing operations as we did last year, hiring the Indians as our employees, furnishing them with our gear and letting them use our beaches to catch our fish for us. And more recently, in more recent times, this is data from 2005, um, a household survey asking households, did your parents used to commercial fish? Did you used to commercial fish? And do you currently fish? And so you can see the current households that fish in three communities on Kodiak back in 2005 was less than 30% um, across the board and, and used to be 80 to 90%. So, I don't want to spend too much time, and there's some references at the end if you're interested in this story, um, but I think fundamentally, and the way fishermen framed it, was that the, there's a fundamental incongruence between the way that village fisheries work and a limited commodified market tradable permit or quota. Um, so one simple quote here, it all started with the permit in terms of the, the sort of outflow of, of rights and, and young people from the fisheries. And another quote here about 
Yuzinki having a, a family fishing and a bartering system, not a maximizing the amount of money that you make from fishing kind of lifestyle. Another couple quotes here um, about when you privatize something, the quote on the right is, is speaking to just like with land, if you have communities who are um, cash poor, uh, you have a high value commodity, um, you have a bad season, you, and there's many stories that were shared with me where people were put in a situation where they felt forced to sell a permit and family members were, um, you know, made to feel horrible because they couldn't purchase, they didn't have enough money to purchase a permit. So it just really created a lot of conflict um, and bad feelings. Uh, we have some of Danielle's and, and our team's more recent work um, is exploring this question of are, are these processes actually shifting the values that people have about what fisheries are for, how, how they can be best managed. The quote on the right is speaking in one of the village communities about limited entry because it was assuming a, a fisherman was an individual, one permit, one boat, it shifted the family style to individual style and it started to introduce more competitiveness among um, people. And the quote on the left is talking about um, there's actually you know a shift in the community of Kodiak where it's it's recognized and more accepted that fishing is meant to be you know a way of generating um, great wealth, uh, whereas before in previous generations it was seen more as a way to provide for a rural livelihood. These are two figures from that um, 2018 paper that I mentioned um, in 2006. The poster on the left was uh, adorned all over Kodiak in terms of kind of capturing this. We don't want any more privatization of our fisheries in 2006. There was a really kind of unified voice and a feeling about that. And the picture on the right from 2016 is showing some signs from a recent um, parade where some members of one of the fisheries there, one of the fleets, um, are very um, vocal in advocating for ITQs. They're seeing it as a way to um, a preferred management for their fishery. And, and that really wasn't present in 2006 in the same way. And so people are starting to use the same kind of language and values to think about why you would want to privatize a fishery. So these, um, another key piece of this, this ethnographic work, again, this, this really has gone on across the globe. This is just one example from Alaska, but um, leasing. So right when you um, give somebody um, an asset right to, a f to, to fish, um, in, in depending on the program, that person might be an, then able to lease that access right to somebody else. And so there's some quote here from in Kodiak about how people that were initially given these ITQs for free didn't feel it was ethical to charge people a lease fee for them because they had been given them for free. But then people had to start buying them. And so the people that bought them felt that it was okay to charge a lease fee because they had to pay debt service. And over time, within a few years, um, according to this quote, some of the initial or all of the initial, I don't know, all or some, um, started charging percentages as well. And now it's quite common where you have leased, you know, leased quota where you're paying a certain amount off the top to somebody who um, you know, isn't necessarily on the boat. And there's some requirements about this, but um, from what we hear, there's a lot of um, ways that people can um, lease uh, for profit. And that happens certainly in other countries as well, where the restrictions on being on, on board are not um, there and for different fisheries. This um, quote at the bottom um, is getting at this idea that um, people that, that have quotas, um, you know, grow to great power and, and hold that power potentially over crew members and others who relatively have less power than they did prior to the um, ITQ uh, revolution, I guess. Um, one of the things you hear a lot in, Kod in Kodiak, you hear this in Iceland as well. Iceland was called one of the most, uh, ITQs were called one of the most tumultuous um, policies in Iceland political history. And there's some really great work, um, Niels Einarsson, Catherine Chambers, others, um, um, Gilsey Paulson, and um, many others um, documenting the case in, in Iceland. But within Kodiak, you hear this a lot about conflict. It's been um, 20 plus years since the privatization of some of the fisheries in Kodiak and people till, still tell stories about how divisive it was. A quote here talking about this, it's, one of the most divisive um, and negative influences that they've experienced in that community. This was a survey on the right there of um, uh, the whole community, the whole fishing community of Kodiak, a random sample, where most everyone agreeing that um, 
IFQ's created conflict in the community was the prompt for that question there. So to, to summarize some of this ethnographic work, I think we have strong evidence in Alaska and, and many countries throughout the globe to suggest that privatization is really changing fishing systems, fishery systems. Equity issues are really central. There's differential impacts um, on rural, Alaska, uh, indigenous, um, younger, low-income fishermen. The diversity of values, communities, fishing livelihoods is not well served by privatization. There's some suggestion these core values might be um, shifting and that privatization has largely been viewed as divisive and negative. We have a website here that um, our, some of our work is, um, our recent work is, is uh, published on if you're interested in, in learning more about that ethnographic work. So given all this, this large body of social science research and data suggesting that privatizations had a lot of disruptive impacts in fishing communities, long-standing fishing communities, why do we have this ITQ panacea that meets us um, in our daily life all the time? And I wanted to go back to the roots of ITQs um, for, for reference. If you look at the early literature on why ITQs, individual transferable quotas are promoted, it's, it's largely and narrowly within fisheries economics. The goal is to maximize aggregate profit. So here you've got Gordon writing in the 50s, predating Hardin, um, but, but in the same line of thought that in the sea fisheries and natural resources is not private property, hence the rent or profits it may yield is not capable of being appropriated by anybody. And a very similar sentiment carries through to today's uh, fisheries economics as I, as I read it. Um, Hannison writing, the basic economic problem of commercial fisheries can be seen as the absence of property rights to the fish stocks. So we don't have to digest this in too much depth, but um, you know, as a student of fisheries economics a bit in my graduate um, years, I just wanted to put this up there as, um, you know, if you're an economist, you're thinking in terms of numbers and money usually. So this is a look at um, a total revenue curve um, and a total cost curve. And the idea is if you don't have property rights, um, people, you know, individuals will be able to make some money fishing. Um, but overall, people will keep entering that fishery until you can't really make any more money. And so you don't make any net profits or you're not maximizing kind of an aggregate profit. But if you eliminated a lot of those people um, and you've, you had less people fishing, less boats fishing, the cost would go down, the profit would still be quite high. And so you're, you're maximizing this, this aggregate profit. And that really, the way I learned this in fisheries economics, that was the goal of ITQs, to consolidate and make a market-based mechanism so efficient fishermen could buy out inefficient fishermen. And that was seen as a positive for society because net um, profits were increased. That's really different than how ITQs are framed often in um, fisheries management discussions and the popular media today. That this idea that ITQs are about consolidation and profit maximization is not really front and center. It's much more in the, you know, buried in the in the small text. Um, this is a couple of figures from Environmental Defense Fund, who is a large proponent of catch shares and ITQ-based fisheries. This idea that um, ITQs are a, a panacea and that they, 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 they serve um, broad goals like conservation and safety, and they work across contexts. This panacea meaning it can apply, it's a simple policy um, solution that can apply regardless of context across the globe. And we see this, the promotion of this um, catch share um, seven step program and, and different things that they're promoting that these should be the way we manage fisheries across the globe. Um, I encounter the panacea of ITQs nearly on a daily or weekly basis. Danielle, as I mentioned, uh, one of our research associates just forwarded me this a couple days ago. Um, uh, this was a, a Facebook post from the Seafood Harvesters of America. Um, and, you know, I, I think here we, you can read through it, but uh, the, the sort of sum, sum up of it is that, you know, we have this Without rational fish, fisheries management, fishermen behave irrationally, they overharvest. This is universal human nature across all fishery systems, across all cultures throughout time. Um, and property rights are, are really the only way to manage and, and think about long-term planning. 
So my question in, I guess, the last part of this um, talk, and I probably have gone a little over, but I'll try to speed up here, um, is how did this panacea come to be? Um, and this is what we explore in this PNA, PNAS um, paper here. So again, I want to thank DG Webster in particular, who shared a few slides that I used in this, in this portion of the talk. In this paper, um, we talk about um, three, and there's more, but we focused on trying to expand upon three, um, three um, processes and, and, and factors that are promoting and entrenching this panacea mindset, one being conceptual narratives, another being power disconnects, and a third being heuristics and biases. So within, and I've mentioned some of these already in looking at the roots of ITQs as a policy tool. If we look in the sort of neoliberal economic paradigm, if we look in the fisheries economic literature, we see a couple things. One, more generally in the neoliberal sort of um, philosophy or ideology that markets are, are more fair than governments. So markets, this is a quote from Hannison, markets get the politics out of fisheries management. So that's seemed to be the, a good thing. We should, we should be doing more market-based. And you see this in carbon trading and, and, and many other privatization um, kind of ideas. In fisheries economics, you hear this, you know, this kind of over uh, capitalization and scarcity argument a lot. There's too many boats chasing too few fish. Going back again to the early fisheries economists writing on trying to get the ITQs on the agenda that in the absence of property rights, according to Maloney and Pierce, a persistent and inevitable outcome is fishermen race for fish, investing in unproductive labor and capital and dissipating all potential resource rents. And Crutchfield, another, I believe, fishery economist writing, the solution is to eliminate the totally useless accumulation of excess capital and labor, i.e. fishing boats, gear, and fishermen, and enclose the fisheries for fewer individuals and vessels, thus maximizing profits for the fleet that remains. So um, the, the potency, and I've mentioned this with Environmental Defense Fund, the potency of this tragedy of the commons or this tragedy of open access narrative extends now far beyond the um, economic dimensions. This is a, a, a longer quote from some of Environmental Defense's uh, Fund's um, catch share materials. Uh, catch shares right the ship with a secure share of the catch. There's no pressure or need to race for fish with a clear stake in the overall health. Um, fishermen's incentives change from maximizing volume to maximizing value. Fishermen no longer become fierce competitors, but are now inspired to collaborate as environmental stewards of the resource their livelihood depends on. This type of cooperation is almost unheard of in non-catch share fisheries where competition, not communication is the rule. Evidence shows that catch shares overcome the tragedy of the commons by providing a clear economic rationale for conserving resources. Even Wikipedia um, is, um, you know, our, our source on, on um, learning about things, you know, a quote here, this was from 2017, overfishing can be viewed as a case of the tragedy of the commons. In that sense, solutions would promote property rights just as privatization and fish farming. Something that we hear a lot in Alaska around the, these narratives that are very entrenched um, is that there's an inevitability that we're moving toward privatization as kind of the only solution. You either have open access insanity or you have privatization. This was a quote from a fisheries um, official. Um, Those who have been displaced or rationalized out of their fisheries might also have found themselves displaced because of the total collapse of a fishery to which access is unlimited, bankruptcy and its consequent displacement, not to mention death at sea because of fishing and unsafe conditions is frequently about the only alternative to rationalization. So in terms of addressing this to commons scholars, I, I probably need not um, stress the point that these narratives miss a lot. Um, the whole body of work on common property um, systems and institutions is missing here. We either have open access or ITQs. Missing is all of the wonderful work that, that many of you are doing on, on fisheries commons. And I got to see a little bit of um, Dr. Javier Bazorto's talk on global fisheries commons work. He gave a nice overview as part of this webinar. And I'd suggest checking out his talk if you missed it, if you're interested in, in how fishermen, fishing communities um, have collectively managed um, commons successfully for millennia without private property. Um, and of course, the political ecology um, of this tale of overfishing is also missed. I'm mentioning here Becky Mansfield's 
w book and chapter um, 2011 where you know the story that we have these really greedy fishermen who just want to fish and fish and fish and in the absence of private property they're going to destroy their ecosystem is a really misleading and, and, and untrue narrative really and she talks in her work a lot about how it was the industrialization in the modernization of fisheries worldwide and certain the 50s this massive scale of fisheries um, the the huge unevenness and the flow of fish from the global south to the global north um, 75 percent of fish exports come from the global south and are consumed in the global north the eu japan and the us accounts for 72 percent of this um, import value um, you know we often hear that the problem with overfishing, you know, lies in the global south, but really it's the export market that's driving this overfishing, not population growth or some other apolitical um, explanation. N not to mention um, government policies for modernizing fisheries. In, in the 2011 chapter, uh, Mansfield cites $16 billion spent on increasing fishing capacity worldwide, four to eight billion spent on fuel subsidies, small-scale fisheries getting displaced by industrial fleets, um, pressures to overfish to supply this um, export capitalist fishing. So I could go on. I, th I th just wanted to mention these are two really important missing pieces in these dominant narratives. Um, so an another major theme in this PNAS paper is looking at power disconnects. Um, like most other forms of management, ITQs create winners and losers in the process that th these programs can widen power disconnects um, and they contribute um, to this panamia, panacea mindset by providing the beneficiaries of some of these benefits influence to ensure that measures are adopted and remain in place. Um, they lock in um, you know, the policy and it becomes very hard um, to dislodge them and increases systematic vulnerability. Fishing communities who experience the costs have, tend to have little political power. Decision makers have little incentive to respond to their concerns. And this is clearly an issue of social justice, but it's much more than that because these are oftentimes communities with intimate knowledge of their resources, you know, and oftentimes millennia long um, knowledge systems and connections to their resources. And they are stewards often of those resources. So it, the dispossession is even more pronounced. These power disconnects are apparent in ITQ fisheries across the globe, uh, Alaska, Iceland, Faroe Islands, Greenland, Denmark, Norway, the United Kingdom, Peru, and many other fisheries where quota consolidation is permitted or where coastal communities are otherwise excluded. Our third major, third and last major um, theme here in terms of what, what's contributing to this panacea mindset um, comes more from human cognition and behavior theory around heuristics and biases. Um, heuristics meaning we tend to rely on these mental shortcuts when we're faced with complex situations. Um, you know, and, and there's list, some listed here in this um, circle. Am I, am I getting close to time? I've, I've got five minutes. We'll go with five and we'll cut down on question and answer. Okay, I can, I can just wrap up too. So, so, so basically, this is largely highlighting that PNAS paper and if you're interested to read on it, but, but basically things that um, we don't even necessarily um, understand as fishery scientists or decision makers that we are employing really biased, bias us um, to not see some of these impacts or to think that ITQs are good. Um, and so anyway, you could get more into that in the paper. To, to tie up and, and finish, so there are some time for questions. We proposed clearly unthinking and retelling the story of fisheries. Um, it, it's not gonna happen overnight. One of the things that we're um, proposing in this paper is an institutional, um, coming from the, field, the fields of institutional diagnostics, a toolkit where fishery managers, scientists, community members might be able to access information and a set of alternatives that they might consider to kind of get out of this um, panacea mindset. So again, th this is described at length in the um, paper, but in terms of these major goals of governance um, identified here, what are, the, you know, what are the goals of a fishery system, a fishery management plan? Do ITQs fit that solution or not? Um, like, like for example, um, you know, if, if one of your fishery management goals is to um, ensure coastal community livelihoods in a, you know, a state like Alaska that's fundamentally dependent on small coastal community fishing livelihoods, ITQs don't fit. And there's a whole host of things that do fit 
Um, but, but, but that's an important thing to be able to understand as a fish manager that there's a lot of data and research um, on these topics you know, across the globe that, that, that hopefully could inform um, decision making. So to conclude here, um, I, I just wanna to mention too, in terms of kind of tying this back to the commons work. So a lot of this work that I presented on is kind of what happens in a, a historically common property system that's gotten you know, colonized and then made into open access and then privatized and kind of where are we at um, myself and, and Jessica Black and Danielle and Rachel and uh, a Jesse, a bunch of our collaborators are working on thinking, you know, looking forward by looking back, working with indigenous fishing communities to, you know, better capture what, what are traditional uh, values around managing salmon? How, um, what were you, rules about use and distribution? Um, what are the community values around caring for fish or, or you know, managing fish and trying to you know, present a whole plurality of ways of thinking about what fishery systems are, what human connections are, and, and helping to sort of show that plurality to some of these um, other ways of knowing that that seem to focus really narrowly on an industrial profit uh, generation type model. So I have a lot of references that I, I had in the talk that are here, and I wanted to acknowledge uh, my team again, as I mentioned, and some of the work I presented, funding from the National Science Foundation, North Pacific Research Board, Alaska Sea Grant, of course, the communities that I worked with, and then the PNAS article um, and discussion. I wanted to um, thank the Institute of Arctic Studies, the Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth College, and the Stephenson Arctic Institute, um, and the Evelyn Stephenson Neff Endowment. So thank, thank you very much. Sorry to have gone a bit over. Oops. You're fine. Uh, so now I'm going to open it up to a Q&A section so all the listeners that are here. Um, feel free to just uh, type in any questions you have in the, the Q&A box that's at the bottom of the screen, and I'll read them out to Courtney, and she'll, she'll answer them. OK, so we have one. Uh, uh, what are those who have stopped fishing now doing alternatively? So that, that's a really good question. Um, in the communities I work in in Kodiak, there's been sort of a rural flight where young people, um, you know, age 18 to 35, communities identify a lack of those young people in the community. If they had the more traditional fishing livelihoods available, they, they, in some, there's a few that are living in the community as fishermen, but largely they've moved out um, to pursue other, you know, other life paths because they didn't necessarily see that as a reasonable or available path to them. Um, there are also, I would say, some concerns around um, community health and well-being that some of the young people that aren't able to pursue other life paths maybe are in the community without meaningful employment and that's created, um, you know, some, some tensions and, and um, and, and problems for the community and anyone who's worked in Alaska or other, um, you know, post-colonized indigenous populations, there's a lot of, um, you know, much higher rates of suicide and other kinds of, um, you know, hard things that, that are the result of multi-generational trauma and colonial process. And, and I think the communities are viewing this as another step in that process, that this privatization is like another kind of, um, yeah, uh, offensive colonial kind of uh, mentality, I guess, yeah. Sure, okay, we have another question. Uh, how did you choose Kodiak for your research versus Homer, Sitka, Cordova, et cetera? That's a great question. Um, I was fortunate enough to be working for NOAA as a fisheries um, research assistant back in 2002 and got invited to um, go on, on sort of a, a, a community visit. Um, we went to Kodiak and we went to many of the villages there and I fell in love with the place. I also got to go to the Alaska Peninsula, but I really wanted to, to be in a place with a long fishing history and, and that really was um, seeming to be experiencing the, this, this dispossession that I was noticing in the data, but then also, yeah, talking with people. So yeah, it was a lucky visit. Awesome. We have another one. Uh, what should we be teaching economics and business students about indigenous worldviews of community resources and the commons? That's a great question. I, I think one of the things I would stress um, is that there's a plurality. So in anthropology, you learn there's culture and culture shapes our entire worldview. You have 
a culture that may think and see and act really different based on differing ways of viewing the world, different you know, epistemologies, different religion. Um, and a, economics, again, I'm not an economist, but as I understand it, there's this sort of universalism, like everyone behaves in this way, whether you're a man or a woman or no matter what, you're, what culture you're from. So I, I think that one of the things we should teach fisheries economics students is about the diversity and plurality of the way that people make decisions, economic or not, and the ways in which um, like fishery systems are really different if you're in a village like Old Harbor or if you're in a, a port like Seattle. You, you can't make a policy that's going to fit both of those places and have it work. Great, thank you. So um, we still have about four more minutes left. The Q&A session is still open for anyone with questions, but this has been an awesome talk. Thank you so much, Courtney. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, we have some we have some comments. I can forward you. There's a, a pretty lengthy comment, not a question from a from a viewer that I can I can email you. Um, okay. Just circling around to the indigenous views of just how we should maintain anything in the commons is just always coming back to the indigenous perspective, which is very true and very very needed. Okay, so we have another question. Have communities adapted to privatized fishing rights over time? For example, were the lessons learned from the loss of Alaska state limited entry permits applied 20 years later when FIQs were issued? Yeah, so um, I, think, um, I think one thing th that's important to note in that is it, from what I understand in, in visiting closely with fishermen about um, the impacts of, of these the limit entry program, it wasn't necessarily obvious like in the 70s, this was a huge problem. It became obvious when people saw what happened uh, through the individual choices that people made and through sort of the acing out of the youth. So I think there's that where it's clear, it's clear now in, in hindsight what's gone on, but it, I don't know that it was clear like in the 80s or the 90s. Um, in terms of the 90s, um, and, and I think to this day, the state of Alaska or, or people um, who, who have more of a biological or an economic view of fisheries, I don't think they would say there's anything wrong with the limited entry program. I think this is a largely an invisible crisis. You know it if you're living in a village like Old Harbor, you know it if you're an anthropologist and study and work with community members, but you don't know it if you're a bureaucrat and you, and you actually have a really different way of hearing that story and telling the story. So I don't know that that the community dispossession has been um, internalized and understood. It's been kind of explained away. And there were some design features of the halibut fishery that tried to like enable a small boat fishery to maintain itself. So I think in some ways they had learned from like Iceland and other examples where they hadn't given any or much attention to consolidation like for scale. So, so there were some lessons learned by the 90s. Great. So we have one more question, and I think this will be the last one because we have about a minute left. So how do we indigenize the biological slash ecological science of fisheries, which is currently Eurocentric as applied in North America? I believe this is a part of your current research. Yeah, I was going to say, come to UAF. We're figuring it out. <laughs> We're figuring it out. We are working in close collaboration with indigenous leaders and scholars. I, I think that's the most important thing. I don't think non-indigenous scientists should be figuring out how to do that. I think it's through close partnership and collaboration and allyship that we're all um, working together and listening to indigenous leaders about how that should look. But recognizing it's an issue is, is the first step and that's, yeah, an important one. Thank you so much, Ainsley, I appreciate it. And thank you everyone for listening in, I appreciate it. And please feel free to email me any other questions. Thank you.